I met George there. I didn't know he was the George fan. He happened to be sitting next to me at one of the first lectures I went to. So I said, what do you recommend for me to go check out? And he said, well, the next guy is this Francois Rebaugh guy. is really good. He's, he's doing a master class next. And when I walked out of that one, I was like, I'm just going to follow you all week because you know what you're talking about. <laughs> that was a quote from Johnny Hamill, the creator of the Kansas City Bass Workshop, talking about his experiences at the International Society of Bases Convention and meeting George Vance for the first time. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations. And today is a best of episode, a highlights episode, a deep dive into a topic that has come up many, many, many times on the podcast over the past decade. And that is George Vance, the great double bass pedagogue and the influence that he's had on bass teaching. And this episode could have easily been six hours long. You'd be amazed at how many people have referenced George Vance over the years. A short and incomplete list includes John Grillo, my co-host for so many episodes. Way back in the sixth episode of the podcast, we were already talking about George Vance. Jeff Turner, the new double bass professor at Indiana University and principal bass of the Pittsburgh Symphony. Virginia Dixon, the great Suzuki specialist. Craig Butterfield, the University of South Carolina. Patrick Nair, retired from the University of Arizona. Heather miller Larden, the wonderful Baroque performer and teacher. And so many other people, we've covered George Vance. I've also dug deep into it on an episode I put together recently called The State of Young Bass Teaching with Kate Jones. We talk all about my experiences at the Suzuki Institute of the Americas in 2018. We have links to all that in the show notes. But today, we are hearing thoughts on George Vance, the person, George Vance's methods. We'll be hearing from Ira Gold of the National Symphony, Nina DeCesar, of the Oregon Symphony, Ted Botsford of the Los Angeles Philharmonic, Tracy Rowell of Oberlin Conservatory, Miles Mosley, the great jazz artist and composer, Yoshi Horiguchi, who is a teacher and pedagogue on the East Coast, and you heard at the beginning, Johnny Hamill, organizer of the Kansas City Bass Workshop and someone who's following in the footsteps of George Vance for sure. I'd like to give a shout out to our sponsors for this episode. Thank you so much to to Diderio Strings, Steve Swan String Bass, Upton Bass, and A440. More from them later, but we'll kick off this episode and talk about following in the footsteps of George Vance. This is a conversation I had with Ira Gold, National Symphony bassist and one of the bass teachers at the Peabody Conservatory. Ira took over George Vance's studio after his passing. And this is Ira relating his experiences uh, with George and what it was like taking over that great artist's bass studio. I mean, it was really great to work with the students because they were, they were mostly girls. And so that was interesting because young female players tend to be very intuitive and very um, intelligent about how they do things. And at the same time, they're also products of his system too, which, you know, I know you, you work with his, his mm -hmm. materials and they're, they're very well thought out and, and he has a plan for every single piece and how it's taught to the student. So, I mean, that experience was really great because I kind of felt like I learned about George and about, Rabat and about that whole world a lot more teaching them than I did before I started doing that, even though I've been working through the advanced materials as a student and have worked all through Rabat materials through high school and college. But working with the students, again, it's just a different experience because they themselves are products of the system. It's different than reading a book about something or it's kind of like reading a cookbook versus learning how to cook with the actual person who wrote the recipes in the cookbook. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like once I started working with students and they were all standing with the Ben Benenton, all of them, nobody was sitting on a stool. So I was the one sitting on a stool. So it was kind of interesting to be like, okay, well, where are they coming from? What are, why are they doing these things? Why are they making these choices? 
and it was just extremely eye-opening and educational. And, you know, it made me really think that I should have spent more time with George, you know, uh, and I, I will always feel that I should have done more to reach out to him. I mean, I did have some interaction with him in the few years that we overlapped since I came to D.C., but after working with all of the students, it just has always dawned on me that um, it would have been even more interesting to have interacted with him more in person. Mm -hmm. Um, So, I mean, it was great. Like, I feel like I have a much deeper appreciation and understanding of everything that he did and that he stood for and that he committed himself to in terms of young people and giving them a really serious and focused and fun uh, approach to the double bass from the, from the very beginning. You know, everything that he gave students from the beginning was um, out of respect and treating them like real musicians, you know. And his method is very sincere in that way. It, it doesn't, it doesn't, um, there's no hiding. It's just, here's how this works. You learn this piece and then you can learn this next piece and then you can learn this next piece. So by the time you do the three volumes, like, a student goes from playing Twinkle to playing the Dragonetti Concerto. And it's kind of, it's amazing, you know, and to, to work with some of the students. And some of them are now, I think that the oldest ones are graduating from college this year. <laughs> I mean, it's, wow. it's interesting just to kind of, I mean, I feel just very grateful that I was able to be a part of that and also grateful to George that he kind of pointed them to me um, at the end, you know, when we talked about it, he said, you know, they, they're going to need someone to work with. Do you want to be that person? And I said, absolutely. Uh, I'm not going to be able to do it as well as you do it, but I will certainly do my best. This episode is brought to you by Steve Swan String Bass. And Steve has been researching top graduation for many years. Here's Steve on the topic. I found some old uh, diagram bass tops in an old violin making book that had violins, violas, cellos, and only four basses from kind of the classic period, the early 1800s. And I took a pattern of uh, kind of a topographical map of thicker in the center under the bridge, and then, you know, the thinnest is right near the edges, you know, just before it flares out and gets strong again. And I put in some measurements that I thought would work. And we use that as a general pattern for top graduation, and it really works. You would be amazed how well this technique works. I've been impressed time and time again at how immediately a bass speaks after coming from Steve's shop and how resonant and beautiful and open the sound is. Learn more at steveswanstringbass.com. And thanks for sponsoring the podcast, Steve. This episode is brought to you by Upton Bass, and have you checked out this new travel bass from Upton? Oh my goodness, what a cool looking design, what a great sounding bass, it's just totally remarkable, and the way that they're launching this product, it's just so perfectly Upton, it's uh, bold, it's innovative, you gotta check out these videos of Gary Upton unfolding, I don't even know how you describe it, putting together, I guess, this travel base. It takes almost no time. It is in a Samsonite piece of luggage. I kid you not. It is just the suitcase. It is literally a suitcase base, but it comes together and it's a real base. It's a nice sounding base. So cool. Just another example of the way in which Upton is innovating and blazing new trails for the bass community. So thank you for what you do, Upton, and thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. Okay, back to George Vance. I've had the pleasure of getting to know several of George's former students. And one who I spoke with first on on Skype before meeting her in person is Nina DeCesar. Since then, she and I have played in the same stand in the Oregon Symphony, spent some time in person together on several occasions. Just a great person, great bass player, and by the way, studied with Ira Gold after George. So here's Nina on what it was like working with George Vance. Well, so he wrote his own method books, so he had a very um, structured way with how he dealt with all of his students. So it was based off the Suzuki method. So you'd have, you know, a weekly lesson and then also a group lesson every Saturday where we would, you know, play scales together and then 
each play for each other and give each other feedback. So there's this kind of, you know, real community aspect of studying with them. And then during the lessons, he would have us play through the pieces that we were learning from memory with the tape um, that comes with those books. And then we would eventually graduate if we could play through the whole book with the tape, kind of Suzuki style. And then he would give out like certificates, which was exciting for a 12 year old, you know. Oh, that. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And then, um, you know, at the end of every lesson, he would say he would have you bow to him and then say, thank you for teaching me today. So it was very structured like that, which is, I think, good for kids to really have an idea of what exactly they're supposed to be doing. And, you know, he had his own skill book and all that. And then the other really cool part of it was he had these workshops every summer called the um, summer base workshops in D.C., and he would have Francois Arbath come and other awesome people like Rufus Reed and Teppo Haruato and like Hans Durm and all these just incredible bass players and teachers. So like from an early age, his students got to experience like a huge wide array of different styles of playing and like different styles of teaching. And it really, I think, broadened his students' horizons a lot. It's been really interesting teaching through his method because... Now that I'm an adult working through it as a teacher, I can kind of see like, oh, wow, that's amazing that he thought of doing this piece with this, you know, preparation, because that really establishes a, you know, a good technique for the kid and they don't even know it. They're just doing it like hooked bowings. I, you know, I'd never thought of introducing it in that way until I saw it presented in that fashion. It's been really cool kind of revisiting that from a different standpoint. Ted Botsford, who when I spoke with him, he was in the Seattle Symphony, but since then he has now become a bassist in the Los Angeles Philharmonic. Ted's first bass teacher was George Vance. And George was actually the local bass teacher for Ted. You think it's sort of funny, someone with such a reputation in the bass world now, but but for Ted, he was the teacher in the area. Here's Ted on his early studies with George Vance. I grew up in Bethesda, Maryland. And it's a suburb of, uh, of D.C. And George just happened to be the teacher nearest me. Um, my, my, my sister actually started playing cello before I started playing bass. She uh, she went to study with George's wife, Martha. And then, you know, I, I sort of decided that I wanted to have something, something to do like that, too. I mean, I had been playing piano before that. Uh, it never, it never took, right. <laughs> you know, I, I did, <laughs> I did keep it up all through high school and stuff like that, but I didn't practice a whole lot and stuff like that. So, but yeah, the bass, you know, George was just like the, the guy who was, who was there and, and we, we, we had lessons at the same time. So it was convenient for my parents and, and, you know, that's, that's sort of how, it, how I got started. Okay. How, how old were you when you started with George? Uh, I was nine. Oh, you're nine. Okay. So, so not not quite as young as some of his younger kids, but but still relatively young. I was I was always sort of a big kid too. So, but uh, like I started on a, qu- a quarter size base. And-, and did you start? You know, like I I I, I teach a fair number of beginners these days, and I've just become totally. I just can't can't say enough good things to anybody who asks about the the Vance books and progressive repertoire that going through that. So I've been. Did you start on like page one, book one? Is that how you started uh, with him? Yeah, that that was basically. It. I mean, he was still doing the base project stuff when I started. So I have the copies of his books that he bound in his basement, you know, and, you know, it still has Hal's name on the cover and, and all of that. It, it was sort of, it was a few years later that, that he got published by Carl Fisher. And let's see, there was, there was a Peabody workshop that happened. And I think I went to the last one before Hal moved to Philly. So that's sort of the time, you know, sort of the rough time when I started with George. For me, one of the hallmarks of great teaching is seeing that individual students go on and do a wide array of things, not just one straight and narrow path. I think Paul Ellison at Rice University is a great example of that. By the way, all the people you've heard so far on the show had experiences studying with Paul Ellison, too. Uh, this next excerpt comes from Miles Mosley, fascinating artist, bassist, composer, just a completely dynamic performer who grew up in Los Angeles and studied with David Young and worked through the Raboff methods, but also the Vance books. Here's Miles on the topic of George Vance. With David Young, I studied from a series it was oh, Harold Robinson and George Vance. It was oh, called the Base yeah. Project Repertoire Books. Yeah, sure. So I did all of those. Okay. So I started from one, you know, as a kid who knew nothing, 
and I went all the way to the end of that and then switched over. Actually, for the Roboth book, aside from Red Book, um, I spent most of my time in the Blue Book just because it was challenging fingerings over different scale patterns, and you know, that's that's what opened up the 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 fourth position and fifth position in harmonics and that kind of thing. Well, I was, I was curious about, about that. Oh, so that's very cool. You went through that whole Vance, Hal Robinson, uh, sequence. And I love that. That's like what I, ex- the exact sort of stuff I work on with my students. And it seems like it frees up, uh, uh, the ability to just let ideas flow in that like neck block position, you know, like the third position for Raboth and the fourth position. I mean, do you think that what kind of an impact has that technical training had on your, just your technical fluency on the bass. I think it's probably the most important part of any instrument is that in order for you to have any type of creative idea, you need to be technically proficient enough that your body gets out of the way so that when you have a brilliant idea that's not yours but delivered to you, you can execute it without stumbling over yourself. What I, what I do like about the, the Vance books is that they were smaller pieces that had a bit more in, interpretive suggestion to it. You know, that it was, there was space to kind of, yes, you need to execute this technically, but tempo and expression and vibrato, it, it just seemed really open, an open way of studying. One of the things that really makes progressive repertoire and the sequence stand out is how the positions are introduced. Tracy Rowell of the Oberlin Conservatory and I, we chatted about many things when she was on the show, but we chatted especially about teaching and about how this non-conventional or, or less traditional, I guess we could say, way of introducing the positions by putting the bassist up in thumb position early on, what kind of an effect that has on someone's learning. Here's Tracy. I think with the George Vance method, um, you probably know from teaching that, you know, for example, he starts in the neck block position and um, thumb position is introduced before half position, which is kind of a departure from, you know, the upbringing that I had in my early years, which was, uh, you know, some Mandel. And George said, you know, if he could get a kid to not play an orchestra until after that point, then he'd be happier. So it was designed, you know, to, to give someone a formation on the bass um, and then George also designed a, a technique book, the Vadi Mikam, to go along with those books. And so, you know, obviously no, no method is complete and, and, you know, I think a teacher needs to supplement um, and meet the needs of the student that they have, or whatever the, their needs are at their particular age and stage. This episode is brought to you by Diderio Strings. Our friends at Diderio want to help listeners change their strings safely and efficiently, and they have a few tricks to help you achieve that. When you pull the string through the peg, twist it around itself a few times before continuing to wind. This pulls more of the string through the peg neatly, and it decreases the likelihood of the string falling out of tension. Learn more at orchestral.diderio.com. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. Whenever anybody's going to the Midwest, and I lived in Chicago, Illinois for years and years, I tell them to go to A440. If they're looking for a bow, if they're looking for a bass, if they need some repairs done, if they have a student who's looking for an instrument, A440 has been serving the community for years and years. They're located just west of Wrigley Field in beautiful Chicago. They do great work, and they've been a big supporter of bass events over the years, whether it's the Chicago Bass Festival or really any bass event. A440, you guys rock. Check them out at a440violinshop.com. All right, back to George Vance and Yoshi Horiguchi contributed an amazing piece to my blog not too long ago, which was an in-depth analysis of book one of progressive repertoire. And it includes, it's, it's, it's awesome. It's such a great way to think about how to teach that first book. Definitely check it out. There's a link in the show notes. And I actually recorded videos of all those pieces from book one and book two, I, and hopefully the rest soon. So those accompany Yoshi's piece. So again, check that out. And here's Yoshi and how he uses the progressive repertoire pieces in a group setting. So the great thing about the George Vance method is um, a lot of the the tunes have um, 
the uh, ability to incorporate in a group class um, of kids of similar ability and also of um, of uh, different ability levels. So um, take Scotland's Burning, for example. Um, it's a pretty relatively, um, uh, uh, I mean, not I, I shouldn't say a simple song, but <laughs> it's one of the first songs that you, you put together um, in, in the series. And um, you can play it in unison as a group. You can also play it in a round. Um, someone working on thumb position, you can uh, uh, have them play in thumb position while someone just starting out is uh, starting in the neck pluck position, or um, which is the, the George Vance method um, uh, philosophy of starting in the ne- neck block method. Or if you're starting in first position and shifting to the high D in, uh, in the Suzuki traditional third position, um, uh, you can do that as well. So um, tackling different positions based on where you are, um, you can use it to uh, uh, make better tone with your bow, working on your um, bow technique. Or you can have your students pizzicato and just um, focus on their left hand. So, um, I mean, between thumb position, different positions, um, developing your bow sound and pizzicatoing, like that's already four different levels of, um, of ability level that you can, uh, you can, um, attack there. Um, <clears throat> Mahler one solo is also a, uh, a great, um, op- opportunity as well. That that's in uh, book two of volume one. So I haven't, um, gotten that far as, uh, as far as putting together a teaching point, but that's also, um, one that I, uh, go to for my group classes. Um, is for someone working in thumb position, they can play it on the, on the, uh, the starting from the D harmonic and just stay in that thumb position uh, harmonic area. Um, they can practice pivoting if they want to do it all on the G string, a lot of it on the G string. Um, they could do it in first position or half position. And for someone just starting out the bass that day, I've, I've had that happen. Um, middle of the year, uh, my director at Orchids comes and says, "All right, Yoshi, you're uh, you got a new student today. He has never played the bass, and uh, here you go." And um, so I'm like, all right. So uh, while everyone else is playing Mahler 1, you and I will play these two notes, D and A, back and forth, the bass player life. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, a good, it's a good introduction to the bass player life, yeah. for sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the, the bass method is, is great because um, there's so many opportunities to um, – present uh, at different levels of um of the same song so that everyone feels included and uh, one person is not like left in the dust and then one person doesn't feel like they're just kind of being dragged along to the last person we'll hear from today he's actually the person that we opened up with in that opening quote it's johnny hamill kc bass workshop and so many other great projects johnny talks by the way in this segment about his book, Jammin' on the Bass. And when I first put out this episode a few years ago, there was a lot of interest in this book. It is a cool book. Again, I'll have a link in the show notes so you can check out Jammin' on the Bass. That's the latter half of this clip. But great to hear from Johnny and someone who worked closely with George and really is carrying on in George's legacy. And in this clip, Johnny's talking about his first International Society of Bases Convention and running as George there. I met George there. I didn't know he was the George Vance because, hey, I'd never heard that name before. And I was going to all these, you know, lectures on teaching because that was where my mind was, was learn how to be a better teacher. And uh, he happened to be sitting next to me at like one of the first lectures I went to and actually handed me a pencil or something. <laughs> and then, you know, so I was just, got, you know, George was a very nice person and I told him who I was and what I was doing and, and he said, oh, and I, he said, I teach. And he said, so I said, what kind of, what, what do you recommend for, to, for me to go check out? You know, he's been there before. And so he, he said, well, the next guy is, is this Francois Raboff guy is really good. He's, he's doing a master class next. And when I walked out of that one, I was like, I'm just going to follow you all week because you know what you're talking about. <laughs> And so in the next year, I went out to his workshop, which was, yeah, I mean, ISB and George's workshops are probably the most significant thing in my life, for sure. Uh, I always say I learned more there in a week than I did in my undergrad. Just That's not true, but, you know, that's the way you feel when you leave those weeks. I love George mainly because he was thinking about how great the next generation will become. And he just opened that door 
see that. I mean, he kind of knew what was what was coming and, and saw all that. And his books really have a, a strong vision of where the child would go. You know, he knew that the Dragonetti would be a, a middle school piece. And, and it is, you know, <laughs> it's kind of hard, <laughs> hard for me to even, you know, swallow that down because I'm like, what? But That's true. The Dragonetti, we, when you go through that, it has become a middle school piece. Isn't that amazing? Easy. I mean, you know, like usually, you know, when you start them at five or six, you know, they're going to know the Dragonetti before they even get out of elementary school. And I mean, I definitely have that and seen it and have had not just a few that's gotten there, but but many of my students know that piece. And, uh, and that's now that I go around the world to all these, or around the country, at least to all these base workshops, that's just true. You know, like it's, it's shown the way for the students to do it. You know, it's not just like some random kid goes, Oh, I'm going to learn this big concerto, you know, like there's a blueprint plan right there. He just goes right in, in order of his book. And, you know, it's, it's fantastic. So, and it kind of brings the bass into parody with the other, like violin and, you know, I, how many, how many young violinists, middle school violinists do I hear playing the Mendelssohn violin concerto, right? I mean, if you, yeah, look- exactly. So now, yeah, now we are, we're not, and, and, and that's the beauty of the whole system. And, 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 you know, the same with Suzuki violin method, it's just, it's kind of brilliant because it, it lets the students become an artist instead of just here, you know, like how I learned how to play classical music was a lot of, here's the etude books. Now go hit it. You know, when you were just, (laughs) you would just practice dedicated practice, you know, like tough it out. And, you know, it's kind of the toughest survive, but you know, with George's book, each piece is slowly giving you a different technique, slowly growing your posture, slowly growing the bow arm and the left hand is this why it jumps around so much, which was definitely a big head scratcher when I first saw that. I was like, why are you showing these kids how to play way up high? You know, like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, we're bass players. What are you doing? But it's, it's brilliant. You know, like, it's, if you think about posture, it's perfect. If you're going to play the whole instrument, you know, you're going to have to stand the way that you're supposed to stand to play the whole instrument, not on the side with the way that the picture of the Samando book, <laughs> like, <laughs> that, 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 that does limit you to the bottom half of the instrument, you know, which is why the Samando book doesn't go up there. You know, like it, it's just a, a wonderful, beautiful thing, technically, uh, musically, you know, the, I remember just reading through it. And as I said, I was an undergrad, I was just reading through the books and, you know, most of it was fairly simple and easy. And, and I was like, this is a wonderful etude, you know, like long, long ago. Wow. That's much better than the etude. I had to practice relentlessly to learn to shift, you know, you <laughs> <laughs> like, it's just, it's kind of a nice little piece. And the students at a young age don't know that they just are joyously playing in this piece because they think it's cool. Well, and it's, it, it's so many parallels to the Suzuki. Like it's the same thing. How do violinists learn to do those shifts through these, these pieces that they're doing? Yeah. Every piece is an is an etude, and so that's why George was adamant about it being a a studio method. A lot of people use them cherry pick through the through the pieces, but he was like, "This is this is like Suzuki didn't cherry pick through the pieces. He had them learn one piece after another. You could teach each piece a different piece every week, you know, if you like. And then as long as they're always reviewing the pieces and playing them, they they grow and uh, it's really nice so i'd love to know and i mean man that's that not cherry picking going through like I, i'm remembering back to one of my violinist students in my old orchestra job invited me to the the betty Haig suzuki school concert at symphony center in Sh- chicago right so you have everybody from the three-year-olds the five-year-olds you know the parents are helping them go the right direction on, on stage to the to the 16 year olds who are playing zugunerweisen in unison right and right and right there's power in that. And I was like watching these students get up and play for an hour from memory, these pieces. It's a powerful thing, man. Yeah, it is powerful. And it's great. I mean, I just witnessed what 28 bass players playing the Bach prelude, which was, I almost cried, 
you know, because <laughs> yeah, no I was like, that's the piece that, you know, I was like, you know, the Dragon Eddie was one thing, but to me, I held special love in my heart for the box Hill Suites. And it was, George actually was like, here, you should try it. And I told him, I was like, no, that piece is too hard for me. You know, like, <laughs> right. and I was, you know, I was kind of, I didn't ever have reservations on pieces. So this is just, the story holds that key to saying where we are now. We're, we're at a different place as bass players because now everybody's like, oh yeah, the, the Bach tell suites, they sound good on the bass, you know? Yeah. Like it's just something to do. And, and I would probably argue that, you know, the Bach tell suites are going to be a middle school piece one day too, which is going to be something hard for me to fathom also. But that's the kind of vision that George gave me anyway, as a teacher and a good teacher gets out of the student's way. George watched me work with my first group of students. And what happened was we would always play some of his songs and then they would always be waiting for this thing to happen, which was um, my first young student was my nephew. And my second one was my daughter. Just, we were having so much fun. She wouldn't, she would not come play the bass. Okay. You know, she was yeah. like, I'm playing the bass with you because <laughs> you guys are having too much fun. So then I just would always jam with them because they were, you know, I mean, they were my family too. So after we get done with the lesson, I would always just start doing what bass players do. And, you know, one of the things that always happens to me is that I always start making up a groove and I start jamming on it, you know, like that's, that's, that's what bass players do, right? Right, right, exactly. <laughs> so I've always done that. And, uh, you know, he just saw me doing that. And the first thing that I ever did was just jam on shortening bread because the first thing in my mind was, hey, that's not how shortening bread goes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's not the way we sing it. It's swung and, and let's just jam on it. So, you know, they already knew where their hands went. So I just started singing it and playing it and we'd have a little jam session. Oh, nice. And so George looked at me and, uh, he saw that thing was, we were hanging around afterwards. And by that time I was teaching at the camp too. And he just said, John, you should write the improv book that goes along with my book. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, and I looked at him and I was like, Rufus Reed is right there. Why don't you let him do it? And he's like, well, you, you, you might, you might you work with the kids enough, you know, like, I think it would be good for you to do it. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, like I just kind of, shrugged this is again one of those things but so basically i wrote this book over the last 10 15 years of playing with the kids that systematically goes from point a to point b that's going to do it for today's episode and i gotta give a big thanks to krista copper who's been going through and cataloging the topics and organizing, time stamping what's talked about on the podcast. Jeff Chalmers of Discover Double Bass had a really interesting conversation with me several years ago. It really hit home about both the the value of the podcast, but also how the more you put out, kind of the blurrier the picture becomes. I love individual conversations with people and I love listening as a listener to that and kind of getting lost in the conversation. There's something special about just hearing two people dig into a topic and you're just sort of there absorbing it like this, this other person uh, sitting in on this intimate conversation. But then also we, we cover, especially on this podcast, well, lots of podcasts, but on this one in particular, we, we are covering some of these timeless topics with many people. And I really enjoy kind of putting together this virtual panel discussion that never really took place <laughs> at the same time. But I think there's power in bringing these different voices together. And I'm trying to do this on a semi-regular basis on different topics. I have many topics lined up for the future. Uh, maybe with the thought of, and then what I'm trying to do also just you know, let you know the process is when I when I get time in my schedule is to actually transcribe these episodes. And I think that that's 
potentially a larger book project, maybe in the coming three to five years. I did put out Winning the Audition, a book back in 2016, and that was kind of what we're doing here today. I, I put together these podcast episodes without even thinking of turning into a book. Then I realized, oh, this would make for a book that could be valuable, and that book has proven to be quite valuable. It's actually sold quite a few copies, and in the physical form, in the Kindle form, in the audiobook form. So right now I'm kind of, I kind of think that I'm maybe writing a deeper, more wide ranging book in public (laughs) with these episodes along with the base community. So I just totally appreciate it. What I learned after doing that in 2016 is I just cannot physically, mentally sit down and catalog these things. I I lost maybe two weeks of my life doing that. Uh, I did nothing but wake up in the morning and and timestamp what had been covered in the podcast. And then I just was not able to find the time to do that making these almost impossible because how the ha- I can't remember whether something happened at 41 minutes or 19 minutes or whatever. It's just too many people. So Krista Copper, you rock. Thank you so much for doing this. You're making uh, episodes like this, which I see as small parts of some greater whole that we will find. Uh, well, I'm not sure what it's going to look like, uh, but we will we will see what that looks like. Like uh, in the next few, I think years, not months, but years. But I definitely see Contrabass Conversations, the book or whatever it ends up being called, becoming a real thing. And I think that this distillation of specific topics is, is that's the heart of that rather than just transcribing every single interview. So that is a very long closer. <laughs> thank you for sticking with me through that. And thank you for listening. And thank and if you enjoy these highlight episodes, ContrabasseConversations.com slash highlights. You can learn more about that. And we have links to everything that was covered here and related topics in the show notes at ContrabasseConversations.com. And Contrabase Conversations is produced by Michael Cooper, Steve Hinchy, Trevor Jones, and Mitch Mooring. Mitch is making beautiful bases in the Dallas area. Learn more at his website, MitchMooring.com. I am your very long-winded today, apologies for that, host Jason Heath coming to you each and every week from San Francisco, California, and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. Um